The holiday season is here, which is an overwhelming time of year for many people, and many of us unfortunately turn to food. Welcome to South Bay Sunday. I'm your host, Sandy. Joining me today are Dr. Christine Pappas, Clinical Director at La Ventana Eating Disorder Program in San Francisco and very soon San Jose. Welcome. Thank you. Nice to be here. Thank you. And Janice Bremis, Executive Director at Eating Disorders Resource Center in Campbell. Thank you, Sandy. You are very welcome. I think this is a hard topic for a lot of people to talk about. Um, food can represent so many different emotions. So right. can we talk really quick about the different kind of emotions people connect food with? Well, definitely um, some of the triggers may be anxiety. Um, when somebody's feeling really anxious from inside, mm-hmm. then they may turn to food, either eat too much or restrict as a way to cope with anxiety. Right. Um, also, depression may be another emotion. Um, stress is also, you know, definitely during the times of the holiday, kind of this busy, on the go, go, go. And you feel um, pressure, too, because yeah. food is everywhere, even yeah. more so, and it's all the fattening stuff. It's, no one's putting out trays of fruit right now. Right, <laughs> right. You know? It's candy, cookies, Everything. more, more, more. What are you bringing? Have this, you know. And there's the notion of it's the holidays. Just go for it. Yes. You know, yes. so that it's even more enticing to people. Yeah. So where are the boundaries around that? Right. Too? And where is the checking in and just following, following your intuition and knowing what's best for yourself? And again, eating a balanced meal, having, you know, moderate types of portions for each meal is important. Um, and it's easy to lose sight of that during the holidays because we are kind of outside of ourselves already, kind of disconnected, mm-hmm. running around, being busy, trying to get it all done. And so much of the holiday season. And like you said, it is around food. The focus is about the food. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's a time of year when um, eating disorders um, is a difficult time for those struggling with an eating disorder because there's so much pressure. Everything is based around the food and meals. And so it's a real challenging time. And there's a lot of pressure with, you know, being in groups. And so people with eating disorders, um, it struggle during this time even more. It's funny because it really isn't about the food. You know, food is just what we yeah. use yes. to yes. cover whatever we want to cover, the feelings we don't want to feel. Right. And I've, I've always thought about that because I've always wanted it to just be about the food. Right. I just want to say, but food tastes good. I like cookies. I like, And if it's good, why can't you eat so many? But it's never that simple. Right. I think it's very gray and very, again, complex in the sense of obviously we need food because we need it to refuel our bodies. We need it to survive. We need it to um, balance our mood and our brain and our body and give us energy to go out and do the things we need to do for the day. But oftentimes with an eating disorder, it's used as a coping mechanism and it's a very powerful coping mechanism. And just to normalize it, I mean, some of us may eat if we're feeling a bit anxious or, you know, go for that extra glass of alcohol, let's just say, if we're feeling anxious. Mm -hmm. Um, Or we may restrict as a way to numb out. So again, the complexity with an eating disorder is a way to kind of deal with um, the underlining issues, emotional issues that may be happening. And then physiologically, there's actually a high that takes place with eating disorders. Um, When we restrict, endorphins increase, cortisol increase. Um, Oftentimes, people go to the binge and then the purge, and there can be endorphin release there. And so, again, there's the emotional aspect of it, and Mm -hmm. then there's the physiological as well. I think with the obesity epidemic that sometimes um, it gets, uh, the message can get kind of mixed. You know, here we're a nation where we have a high percentage of obese people, yet we have people who with eating disorders are starving themselves or binge purging, and we we feel that there's like a spectrum, and we need to balance, and we need to send out a um, a message together, a joint message that, about prevention, that you can't just tell someone to go on a diet. You know, it has to be... Right. It's almost it's almost an insult, too. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because yeah. you can't just fix it. It right. doesn't work right. like that. Right, right, right. And it increases the shame and the guilt. Right. And so oftentimes when I work with patients and so much of the work I do is with families and couples to help educate the family and, and partners to know that there is no quick, easy fix. And it often takes time to recover. And it's a journey. And it's a very subjective journey. And oftentimes I'll have a parent 
parent or partner say, well, just go on that diet or stop eating or eat more. You know, why can't you just do this? And that only um, intense, aggravates. yeah, aggravates and then increases the shame and guilt and anxiety. Because they don't understand the emotional places no. that this is coming from. Right. 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 And right. all they know is this is what you're supposed to do. Right. So yes. why aren't you doing it? Right. Yes. Yeah. And I think at the holiday times, you know, uh, if a family member, if someone has an eating disorder, there might be more pressure, but it's better just to not, you know, talk about it or make comments mm-hmm. on the person's weight or don't comment what they're eating on. It's almost or, like it's so taboo. Yes, you know? yeah. People don't know how to handle it. Right. right. And binge eating is actually the most common is disordered it? eating. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. I was going to ask you about that. So when we're talking about eating disorders, are we just talking about, most people just assume anorexia and bulimia, yeah. right? No. There's the binging. So binging is actually, I find that so often in, in my practice where um, somebody will be just obsessed around the food and eat, eat, eat. And, and they don't know how to stop. Um, anorexia and bulimia, um, that's something that I see often at the clinic, and obviously so because they're coming in for more intense treatment. Um, mm-hmm. But we definitely do see people who just binge, and that's being that's obviously very, very um, When you say complex. just binge, do you mean like they'll just sit there and, and just eat for a long period of time? A large amount of food. Large, okay. Mm-hmm. okay. To the point of being so stuffed. And sick almost. Yes, yes. Okay. And then they may restrict though so there may be the punishment um, the punishment and feeling so physically full that they're almost in a food coma so to speak and physically just feel so exhausted actually um binge eating is going to be added to the ds yes the dsm5 oh, really? yes, yeah. yes. So oh, it'll be an as a diagnosis, diagnosis. yeah exactly yeah. and and there's a gray area too of kind of this disordered eating and i think that's what was being mentioned earlier like we may all have a time in our lives where we may eat more to excess or we may restrict or we may exercise a little bit more so there may be tendencies for this disordered eating and then with the diagnosis of bulimia anorexia and binging that's to a point where it really does hinder your ability to function it's kind of like depression or OCD, we all have a little bit in our lives, um, but when it interferes with our being able to work and you know mm-hmm. be healthy, and that's when it's serious. Yeah. Um, but it's it's just that spectrum, mm-hmm. or when your life revolves around it. Right. Like, right. When you right. make we think plans about it, based yes, on it all the time, know? all the time. Because often I'll find that people can continue on with school or work, and there's this kind of then denial or this illusion of oh I'm fine, and really the obsessing of the food is always taking place, but they're still kind of existing in their in their world. And then until one day when they can't function anymore, and then they usually seek treatment. Or a family or a partner will say, wow, you need to go into treatment. And that's sad because um, there's this misconception that uh, someone looks like they have an eating disorder. There is no special look. You know, you can't look at someone and say they have an eating disorder. So we had at our support group, one late young girl says, yeah, people say, oh, you don't look like you have an eating disorder. And what does that mean? She's well, not, she's not like skinny, skinny, skinny with no meat on her mm-hmm. bones. She's mm-hmm. normal weight. And, and, and so that's another challenge. Mm-hmm. And, and people with eating disorders have a misconception of their body image. Absolutely. So like uh, uh, recently, it was kind of funny. I was talking to someone and he said, well, you look pretty beefy for someone who's suffering from anorexia. And it was like just blew me away because then I started obsessing about. Is that to you? Yeah. <laughs> So I was like, oh, gosh, it was like, I don't know. It just made me really. So it's like people with eating disorders are sensitive to anything you say. So it's like they're like if you say you have um, you look healthy, they're going to say, oh, does that mean I, you know, they take it wrong. Right. Well, it's funny, too. Even today, like I I get excited about baked goods because that's been my thing. But my coworker said, you'll like you'll this will be good for you. This interview will be good for you Mm. because I know how you are with food. And I I was almost like. (laughs) And how am I? What is that supposed to mean? <laughs> like, yeah, like, I mean, exactly. Yeah, yeah. that's why yeah. I was like, maybe is it just, like, why can't it just be about loving food? Right. But, yeah. you know, it never really, you have to know when to stop, and that's the hardest part. Yes, mm-hmm. and that is, and again, what does food, food symbolize? What's the metaphor of food? Nurturing, soothing, and so oftentimes people do turn to food as a way to self-soothe mm-hmm. and a way to feel good for that moment, you know, and, and of course, have that cookie or have that whatever, piece mm-hmm. of bread or pasta, whatever it may be, and 
and then also know, okay, when is it time to stop, and are you feeding yourself emotionally or, or and or physically? So mm-hmm. kind of tuning in intuitively to when do you need, you know, when listening is it, to your body. Yes, listening yeah. to your body. And Sandy, you said uh, that you love food, and I think that's great. It's good to, you know, there's yeah. nothing wrong with loving food. And most cultures um, revolve around meal times, and that's part of the tradition. And I, we've gotten away from meal times, so I think that's contributed part of the disordered eating and the, you know, obesity because people aren't sitting around a table eating meals and Mm -hmm. taking their time. It's rushed or... And we have a lot more processed food out now, so that's good for your body. Right. Right. You know, and I was just, as you were talking about, Janice, about community, community is so important and oftentimes that gets lost in our culture, again, just because we're so busy and part of the holiday season is getting back to, well, what is our community and what is the meaning of a holiday? And rather than focusing on the food, again, I love food too. (laughs) So I'm all pro. Good food is great. But again, just looking at the holidays as more than the bigger picture, the bigger picture of love, community, nurturing. Um, You mentioned, Janice, about being triggered by that comment Mm -hmm. that was made. Mm -hmm. Wow, you look beefy. And um, when I work with um, with parents and couples and and again, especially during the holidays, as we're talking about this um, is triggers, you know, that family members focus on, well, how are you doing? And it's wonderful to see you versus making comments. Comments about oh you look more thin or you look bigger the or you want to diet or, or gee you look more healthy or um, are you following your meal plan or monitoring and ha- kind of the food police and so I often hear that from patients that it's such a big trigger and that's one of the reasons why the holidays is so already so anxiety provoking is that they may be going back to see family that maybe they haven't seen them for a while or it's already an intense situation mm-hmm. and it's intense usually so for everyone if you, so if you have a um, a college student coming home for the weekend and they're suffering, just be careful on what you say because you can say, oh, you look healthy and they can um, misinterpret that. Maybe you can say, oh, I like, you know, your eyes are look beautiful or I love what you're wearing or something else that's not Address them as a human first. As a human, right. yeah. 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 For who they are rather than what they are or what, what they're weighing think, yeah. or, you know, anything that can be, again, just focusing on the physical appearance. Now, if you if you think that someone may be struggling with this or know someone who's struggling with this, uh, what do you recommend? The steps to taking care of yourself? or One, I think support groups are really important. Um, reaching out, knowing that you're not alone is key because so much of the eating disorder... Um, part of the shame and guilt, and even for families, is that you're alone or, you know, this should be fixed immediately. So um, I really like actually the going online and looking at something fishy or um, even EDRC. Um, What's something fishy? Oh, something fishy is um, a website. It's for eating disorder. Um, it's full of information of, of resources for people struggling with an eating disorder and tips. Okay. Um, and EDRC has a really comprehensive um, website. Website. Um, it's e- www.edrcsb.org. And on there we have a lot of um, different information, including when our support groups meet. Um, we actually um, are the only organization providing free support groups. We provide them twice a month. And then we also have one for parents and loved ones that meets. And we're starting a new one in Santa Cruz. And at La Ventana, we have a support group. It's free on Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 11.45. And someone can always call to the, into the program as well, La Ventana, um, and ask for an interview or a phone interview or an assessment. So oftentimes that's the way to go, too, to get in and just bring your loved one in and say, you know, is there a problem? Um, how do we go about this and what would be the right treatment? Mm-hmm. Um, also, doctor and MD, but it's sometimes difficult to find an MD who specializes in eating disorder. That's a challenge. Yeah. The challenges are is to find the experts to treat and the fact that you need a team. You need a mm-hmm. dietitian, you need a therapist, psychiatrist, yeah, you need the whole so team. Yeah, and then also the insurance coverage. Insurance cover- companies will reject it as not They don't think it's a illness. Yeah, yeah. that's too bad. Yeah. Um, there's also a wonderful association called APTED, um, Association of Professionals Treating Eating Disorders. Um, that's uh, in San Francisco, and um, it's a um, place where, again, people can call in and get resources. Kind of like EDRC's sister mm-hmm. organization in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. So we're a one-stop shop where you can go get 
information on support groups, on resources, and therapists, nutritionists. Therapists, awesome. nutrition. Yeah. And then that's, yeah, APCID is like our sister mm-hmm. organization. So, yeah. Great. This has been South Bay Sunday, and I've been your host, Sandy, today. Joining me were Dr. Christine Pappas, Clinical Director at La Ventana Eating Disorder Program in San Francisco and soon San Jose. Also, Janice Bremis, Executive Director, Eating Disorders Resource Center in Campbell. We've been talking about overeating, uh, eating disorders, especially with the holiday season here. Is there anything else you wanted to mention before we wrap up today? Um, well, one of the things we're doing is we're having uh, to help counter the negative media message from the fashion and beauty industry that cashes in on the insecurity of our young women and men, too, drilling into their hearts and minds that you are what you um, look like. Mm-hmm. We're having an essay contest. Uh, it's open to all 6th to 12th graders, and uh, we award cash prizes up to $300, so check online for that. Uh, and Kaiser is our sponsor for that. And then uh, one other opportunity I wanted to add is that um, for the year end to please consider EDRC in your year end giving uh, we have an opportunity the health trust is matching all gifts dollar for dollar up to 25000 that we received through December 31st so this is another way to help if you would like to support our efforts. Yeah, and I guess just for those who might be in question of um, wanting more help or a family member who is in question of maybe their son or daughter who has an eating disorder and um, just putting it out there that you're not alone. And what I often tell my patients is to reach out to your community rather than your eating disorder and just know that there's plenty of support, wonderful resources, and just um, to get um, the help that you need so you don't have to go through this alone. Absolutely. Well, Janice and, and Christine, thank you so much for being with us today. We appreciate it, and happy holidays. Thank, thank you. you. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. And thank you, Sandy, Janice, and Christine. The holidays are really hard to go through alone, especially if you're a senior. We'll talk about that when South Bay Sunday continues.